Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God some praise all over the room. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus. I don't want anyone else. Hallelujah. It's all about him. Listen, I thank God for the Lopez family. I, so I got stationed uh, at Fort Hood. I know it's called Fort Cavazos today, but it was Fort Hood back then. I got stationed in Fort Hood in 97. And in 98, I was in, uh, I was in Third Signal Brigade. And in 1998... Uh, one of my mentors came to me and said, hey, man, I'm sending you down to first calf. And I said, uh, I, I don't want to go to first calf. And he said, I didn't ask you. And I said, oh, okay, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't know how that works. And a couple of days later, I was wearing a cowboy hat. Uh, and I'm from Brooklyn, and uh, so I didn't like that. Uh, but I met uh, Pastor Carlos in 1998, and we've been friends ever since. I honor you, man of God. I honor your family. And I, I honor the Revive Colleen Church. Come on, let's put our hands together for what God is doing in this church. This is a beautiful thing. It's a special thing. I do have a word from the Lord, and I do need to release it. Can I do that? And then after that, I'm going to take off because I need to get home, all right? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity now to make an impartation of righteousness. I give myself over to you. You said in your word, Lord, that we have not need that any man would teach us anything. But the anointing which we receive from you, the Holy Spirit, he's the teacher and he teaches us all things. So Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. I give myself over to you now. You speak through my vocal cords, you think through my mind and you operate through my limbs. That your glory, your anointing, your favor will be manifested through this word. I declare burdens will be removed. Yokes will be destroyed. Lives will be changed by your word. And if you agree with that, say amen. amen. And amen. Give God some praise. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So as you're, as you're having your seat, some people ask me, well, what, what, does, uh, what does God sound like? Well, it depends on who's talking, right? It depends on who's talking. Like you, if you say, uh, uh, I think you guys are about to fly on Southwest. I'm about to fly on Delta Airlines. Uh, when I get on the plane in a little bit, uh, what does Delta Airlines sound like? Well, it depends on who's talking. Well, right now, God sounds like a Dominican kid from Brooklyn. Uh, so for the next few minutes, that's what we're going to talk about, right? You're gonna, God is going to sound just like me, uh, and God will minister through me. So I prayed about uh, what to share with you in this morning, and this is one of those topics where, um, I don't know, as a preacher, and we talked about it, as a preacher, this is one of those things like, you know, uh, I don't know if I want to talk about this, God, but if you want me to talk about it, I got to preach the whole counsel of God. If it's in the Bible, we need to preach it. Say amen to that. And so we have to address the whole counsel of God. But, but how many of you know that people get funny when you talk about money? All oh, right, yeah, yeah. Nobody wants to say amen. It was like, oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. You know what I'm saying? No, but it's fine. Listen. God is not trying to get something from you. God is actually trying to get something to you. And what we want is we just want to be good stewards over everything that God has placed in our hands. And so as I prayed over what to share with Revive Church today, the title of today's message is The Power of Sowing and Reaping. Say, The Power of Sowing and Reaping. The Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sow that shall he also reap. It's like not even a mystery. Like it's not, it's not a mystery. Listen, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. There's this system of sowing and reaping that governs the planet. And so you know, you know that there's some people that just sow certain things. That's what they do. And whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. I'm the first of my family born in the United States. I'm a, first, I'm a, I'm a, a child of two Dominican immigrants uh, to, to New York. And because I'm the first of my whole family to be born Americano, to be born American, you know, they'd be like, oh, mira, you know, tú tienes que hacer algo. You know, they'd be like, hey, man, you got to do something. You know English. You know, <laughs> you know English. You got to do something with your life. And I'm like, okay. So as I was going back and forth to the Dominican Republic, I would have these weird experiences to, because in New York, I, you know, I was told, you know, black and brown kids in East New York, Brooklyn, you guys are poor and where you guys are raised, like I, I was raised on welfare and I, I had to buy food with food stamps and I hated it. Let's be, let's be honest. I, I didn't like it, right? So I didn't like having to use food stamps, uh, but it was what it was and we needed it during that time and we took public assistance. 
Um, but what was weird was in New York, we were considered poor. And then when I would go to the Dominican Republic and I'm there with my family and my grandmother's house had no running water, no electricity and an outhouse. And you know, you had to use, a, you ever, anybody ever use an outhouse? Like you like, and then you'd be like, man, I hope I don't fall in this hole. Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, oh my God, you don't know what I'm talking about. You'd be like, ho, ho. And then, and you know, they, you'd be like, and especially at night, you know, all kind of stuff. Or and like you get up in the middle of the night in those kind of environments, you had this little thing to pee in, you know what I'm saying? Like, a, and, and so you, and so you, all of that. So that was that, like this weird thing. I'll go, like uh, when I got old enough, when I was a little kid, my mom used to bathe me in like a basin. And then when I got old enough, she was like, vete a bañar ahí con los primos tuyos. Go go down to the river and bathe with your cousins. I was like, what does that mean? And then we go down to the river and then they take off their clothes. They butt naked. And I'm like, oh, snap, what's going on? Then they pass me some soap and they're like, hey, take a bath. And I'm like, oh man, this is what we doing now? This is what we doing now, right? So, so if they would say, you rich, you live in New York. And in New York, it was like, no, we ain't rich. But even in that environment, my mother always gave stuff away. My mother's a sower. My mother sows. My, my mother sows primarily in three areas. My mother sows food. Say food. Clothes. Say clothes. And friends. Say friends. Let me explain those three. So, so my mother always gave away clothes. And so she would give away clothes. We would get to the Dominican Republic with suitcases full of clothes, and we would leave with our suitcases empty. And I'm like, man, she gave away all my clothes. You know, I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? And then like you, or I go down to the river and on the way back from the river, somebody I don't know would be walking up and be like, hey, tu era Lenin. that's what they used to call me. I'm like, yeah. Oh man, I'm your cousin. He's like, oh, okay. Yeah. When you leave, I want that shirt. What about those pants too? Yeah. I like these shorts. Those shorts will fit me. I'm like, dude, I don't even know you like that. You know? And so like people always trying to take my stuff, but, but my mother gave it all away. And because she gave away clothes, guess what? We always had clothes. Man, she always had clothes, and she gave away food. She's given away food forever. That's all she does is give away food. As a kid, she was always cooking, and in my house, people would just show up to my house. Like, like you know, you know, family come, come in from the Dominican Republic, and they would live different places, and people would just show up at my house for breakfast, or people would just show up in the afternoon. My mother always had food. My mother's always giving away food. What's funny is I live in the Dominican Republic, and I live... I bought a place in a, in a gated community in the Dominican Republic. And when we bought a house in the gated community, me and my wife, the Lord put in our heart to buy one for my mother. So my mom, we bought her a place right next to ours in the gated community. And so because we don't live there, we just travel there a few times a year. Sometimes when I show up, the gate guard, you know, there's like a guy with a shotgun. The gate guard, sometimes they don't know me, right, because I'm always traveling. And so sometimes I, I'm one of the first people that moved into that neighborhood. And when I drive up, they'd be like, can I help you? And I'm like, yeah, I live here. And they're like, I don't know you. And I'm like, come on, man, really? Now I got to go through this, explain who I am and that kind of thing. But then I say, yo soy el hijo de Nelsida. And I'll say, I'm Nelsida's son. And then they go almost every time, and this makes me mad. They go, oh, I'm Nelsida's son. That's what the gate guard would say. Like, that's my mama. Uh, yeah, whatever, dude. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, because she feeds you every day. You know what I'm saying? And so my mom, every day, she's like all the gate guards eat breakfast in my mom's house. She always, un cafecito. She always giving everybody food. So she's always going to have food. And then my, my mom knows how to, the Bible says, if a man is to have friends, you got to show yourself friendly. If you want to have friends, you got to show yourself friendly. My mom has that down pat. You know what I'm saying? She would like, you know, mira, tenemos que cumplir. Con fulano de tal. Vamos a ir. No come, porque cuando llegamos allá, you better not eat. Because when we get over there, we got to eat something. You can't be disrespectful. You got to be hungry. Mommy, I'm hungry now. You know? And then we have to go all of these houses. And then you got to stop at 17 people's houses. And then like, mira, para ahí. Ahí. No, mommy, I, ain't, I didn't come over here for that. You know? And, but she's like, that's how she is. And because she's like that, she has all kind of friends. And so she knows how to sow in these three areas. So I've been working on my mom to sow money. Say money. Oh, she ain't trying to hear that. You know what I'm saying? She's not, she's not, she's like, hey, you know, we'll talk about that another time. And so, so she's good with sowing in all these other areas. But here's the thing. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. And there's one area that we as believers, we as Christians need to grow in. Sometimes a lot of us need to get exposed to the fact that it's okay to grow in this area as well, and that's in the area of our finances. Say finances. 
How many of you could stand to be blessed financially? All right, 23%. All right, okay, I guess the rest of y'all, y'all good. But, but for the rest of us, yeah, that can stand more, there's a system. There's, there's a system that God created, and the system that governs the earth is the system of sowing and reaping. What we want to do is we want to be able to sow so that we can reap. Say amen to that. All right, so uh, let's look at a couple of things. We already looked at Galatians 6 and 7. I quoted it for you. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sow, that shall he also reap. I'm going to talk about this system of sowing and reaping that governs the earth. I'm going to read several scriptures for your hearing. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, the Bible says, God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind. Say this. Say everything reproduces after its kind. And the fruit tree has seed in itself and so it was upon the earth. Look at, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says that the fruit tree yields fruit after its kind and it has seed within itself. So I said in the morning service that a mango tree cannot produce apples. Why? Because every tree is going to reproduce after its own kind and the seed is already there. It's already inside of the fruit. So God set up a system of reproduction, say reproduction. God never intended for anything to be stagnant. God intended for everything to be reproducing and for it to reproduce after its own kind. God put the seed inside of the tree. God put the oak tree inside of the acorn. There's an oak tree inside of the acorn, but it will never become an oak tree if you don't sow the acorn. Jesus said, unless a kernel of corn falls into the ground, it dies. It remains yet alone. He was talking about himself. He was, when Jesus was on the earth, he was the only begotten of the Father, right? But he was talking about himself. He said, one day I'm going to die, and, I, and when I'm going to go down into the ground, what happens is unless a kernel of corn goes, dies and goes into the ground, it remains yet alone. But if you put it into the ground and it dies, boom, it's going to reproduce and create a harvest. When Jesus was on the earth, he was the only begotten of the Father. Now that he went down into the ground and died, he is the firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters. He was reproduced because Jesus became a seed. Say amen to that. And everything reproduces after his own kind. First John says, watch this, as, say this, as Jesus is, so am I. In this world, Jesus was the incarnation of God. He was the incarnation of God in the flesh. And you and I are the continuation of his incarnation. Say amen to that. So we're supposed to continue what he started. Everything reproduces after its own kind. So God put more trees inside of the tree when he put the seed inside of the tree. So that's why the Bible can say that, watch this, that's relating to trees. Now let's talk about humans. Genesis 1 and 28. The Bible says God blessed them. Say them. That's male and female them. God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the face of the earth. Why is it that God said, be fruitful? He did not say, be seedful. Because you already have the seed. What he wants you to do is work the seed so it can produce the fruit. So how do you work the seed? You have to sow it. Say, I have to sow it. If you have seed and it's outside of the ground, it's not going to reproduce. If you go over here to one of these uh, like hardware stores or whatever, and you'd be like, hey, I want, where's the gardening section? And you go look at all the seeds. There's like thousands of seeds. None of those seeds are doing anything because it's not in the ground. Say this, I have to sow my seed. Some, listen, you're going to learn that when you have seed, it's not going to do anything until you sow it into the ground. Say amen to that. Genesis 8 and 22, the Bible says this. God, we know that God destroyed the earth with water. And after he did, he said this, while the earth remains, for the rest of the time there's an earth, while the earth remains, he said this, seed, time, and harvest shall not cease, cold and heat. Summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. While there's an earth, there's going to be seed, time, and harvest. Say amen to that. 
you are going to reap whatsoever you sow. So in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1, which is the very next verse, we see that God destroyed the earth, but he did not destroy his system. What he said in Genesis 1, he says again in Genesis 9. God said to Noah and his family, God bless Noah, God bless his sons, and he said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So God set up a system, and although he destroyed the earth, he did not destroy the system. And what is the system? It's a system of sowing and reaping, cause and effect, and the free will of humans. So you get to, watch this, if you don't like the harvest you are reaping, the only way to change it is to change the seed you are sowing. If you're getting something back that you don't like, you need to check what you're putting in. So the only way to change your harvest is to change your seed. Say amen to that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 from the Passion Translation, the Bible says, our generous God supplies abundant seed for the farmer. And this seed becomes two things, bread for our meals, you know, and he's even more extravagant, so he's doing all of this. This is what God does. First, he supplies every need plus more. Say plus more. Say God supplies all my need plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that you can have a harvest and you will grow in your generosity. So there's two things that God says there. God provides to you two things. Say this. Say I have seed for sowing. Say I have bread for eating. So this, when money comes into your household, you and your spouse should get together and pray and say, okay, Lord, out of this, out of what's come in, how much of this is seed for sowing how much of this is bread for eating? Some of this I'm supposed to enjoy now. Say now. Some of this I'm supposed to sow into my future. Say future. Here's the problem. If you eat all your seed and you don't sow any of it, you're cutting yourself off from a future return. So I, I'm, I'm not a farmer, but I did go to the DR every year as a kid, and I was around it a lot. And when the, when the people, when farmers are taking the harvest out of the ground, they take a certain amount that they have to go back and sow again. Why? So that they can have another harvest. If they take everything that came out of the ground and eat it, there won't be no future return. So when, when something comes into your household, what you don't want to do, say this, I will not eat my seed. A portion of it is seed for sowing. A portion of it is bread for eating. And what you want to do is ask the Lord to show you, to discern by the Holy Spirit, what part of this is supposed to be seed for me to sow for my future, and what part of this is supposed to be bread for me to eat. This is the system that God created so that he can fund kingdom projects all over the world. Another scripture in 2 Corinthians said that, watch this, while I sow it, God actually multiplies the seed while I'm sowing it. So as, as I come up and I'm sowing it, while I'm sowing it, God multiplies it, and then it's going to come back to me as a multiplied harvest. Say amen to that. See, the, the thing about what God, you, you mentioned this morning, Pastor Carlos, that God transitions us from the system of buying and selling to the system of sowing and reaping right? In the world, everything is buying and selling. The problem with that system is that that system is one for one. Say one for one. If you go over to the dollar store, and I know that the dollar store is not the dollar store no more, I think, right? I don't even think it's a dollar store no more. But anyway, let's say you go over to the dollar store and you say, how much is this? And they go a dollar. Let's say when it used to be a dollar. I don't know. And so, so let's say it's a dollar. And so, so watch this. If I grab one and it costs a dollar and I give them a dollar, how many am I going to get? Okay, if I give them $5 and I want that thing, how many of them am I going to get? Five, right? Because it's one for one. Say one for one. The good news is that with sowing and reaping, it's never one for one. With sowing, see, see, when you buy something, you get, you get whatever the price is, you give them that, they give you one. But when you sow something, it's a seed. And, and that seed is always going to bring you a multiplied harvest. Say amen to that. Say, with God, is not one for one. Let's look at the example of the widow's offering. In Mark chapter 12, let me begin reading at verse 41. The Bible says, Jesus sat near the temple collection box 
and he watched as people put money into it. Now, I'm not making this up. This is in the Bible. Don't get mad at me. Jesus paid attention to the offering. When people was coming around and putting money in the offering, Jesus sat there and watched, and he watched what people were putting in the offering. I didn't make this up. It's in the Bible. And many rich people put a lot of money in it. Verse 42, then a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth less than a penny. And then Jesus called his disciples and said, hey, come here. I want to teach you something. And, and they, they said, what? He said, this poor widow put in only two small copper coins. But the truth is, she gave more than all the rich people. What are you talking about, Jesus? The kingdom of God, you got to see things through God's lens. She gave more than all the rich people because she gave 100% of what she had. And so they have plenty and they only gave, this is what Jesus said, they gave what they don't need. Say this, say this, if it doesn't move me, it's not going to move God. It's not about the amount. It's about how much of it is a sacrifice. God is looking in the New Testament for sacrificial giving. God wants your heart to be in your giving. God wants you to have a generous spirit because that's how God is. He says, this woman is very poor and she gave everything that she had. She gave money that she needed to live on. And so he was saying these other people gave a lot of money, but what they gave, they don't even need it. And so they, they're giving out of excess. They're give, giving out of abundance. And this woman gave out of need. She gave more than they gave. And watch this, watch this. Jesus did not say... She's wrong. Jesus did not say, hold on, come here, mama. Come here, mama. Come on, you're so poor, and you gave, the, you gave everything you had, mama. That's not right. Come here. Give me that offering bucket. Let's get some money out of here. Let's make sure mama goes home with some money. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. He didn't say, he didn't say watch this, if it was today, that church is taking advantage of people. They got people that are poor, that are giving what they don't have, and here you got other people that are driving these big old cars and have all this money. That's not right. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus didn't say, let's give her the money back. No. Jesus knew that she could not afford to give. Therefore, she could not afford not to give. If you're ever in a situation where you don't have enough, you're in a situation where you got to give because that's the only way you're going to get out of your situation. I remember uh, Pastor Carlos shared a little bit of my testimony. I, 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 don't, I won't go through all that this morning, but I'll just say this. When I got born again, I was in a, uh, in a financial situation leading up to me getting born again that was not good. And I was a staff sergeant, United States Army, but I was in a financial bind. And every time I got paid, after I paid everything, I didn't barely have anything left and I didn't have enough to tithe. And I went to my pastor and I said, Pastor, I love God, man. I'm serving in all of these areas. I was crying. I was in tears. I said, I cannot afford to tithe. And he looked at me and said, son, I love you. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. You cannot afford not to. So glad you're listening to our podcast. We're believing it'll bless your life. And our desire is to impact more souls with the gospel of Christ. If you want to join this mission and want to give today, we will be so grateful. And you can do so by visiting our website, at www.revivecolleen.com or text GIVE to 844-462-9071. Now let's get back to the message. He said the only way you're going to get out of your financial hole is for you to find a way to give your way out. He said the way the system works is a system of sowing and reaping. So I had to learn, I actually in my case, long story, I'm not going to go there, but I actually wound up getting a second job. I worked at Blockbuster Video uh, just so I could make enough money to tithe. And then later when I got to Fort Hood, Texas, I, I actually got a second job at Casa Olay in Coppers Cove, Texas. I don't think that's there no more, but it was there in 97. Uh, uh, but I worked at Casa Olay in Coppers Cove, Texas uh, as a second job, and I was a warrant officer in the United States Army, and I did it until I had enough money to get out of that hole. But I was committed to give my way out. 
because this is the system that God created in the Bible. Say amen to that. All right. You don't have to believe me, I mean, but I'm just sharing the word with you. All right, so here's some things that we can learn from this. The woman could not afford to give, so she could not afford not to, and, the, and Jesus commended her for it. Jesus commended her for it. In order for this woman to get out of her financial situation, she had to put seed in the ground. Jesus was basically saying, listen, I'm happy for this woman because I know that my father is the Lord of the harvest and he will see to it that she reaps a harvest on every seed sown. Because she gave, I'm confident that my father is going to meet all her needs. Say amen to that. Amen? All right. All right, let me keep going. Uh, uh, The rich young ruler. Let's deal with the rich young ruler. This this will be the last guy we deal with, and then we'll wrap it up. Mark chapter 10, let me begin reading at verse 17, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. The Bible says, now as he, Jesus, was going on a road, a man came running and knelt before him and asked, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. He called them good teacher. Say good teacher. And then Jesus said, the only one that's good is God. So Jesus is like, hold on for a minute. Let me me make sure I understand what you're saying. Because you remember the time where uh, in Matthew chapter 16, the Bible says that Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? He gave them the answer to the test right there. (laughs) He said, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they answered him and said, well, some say, because there's always going to be some some says, Some say that thou art Elijah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. He said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon, the son of Jonah, said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, oh, wow, flesh and blood has not revealed that unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You just got a download from another world. You got a revelation that I am the son of God. Fast forward to this conversation. The guy comes up and says, good master. Jesus said, oh, hold on for a minute. Good master, the only one that's good is God. So are you saying that I'm the son of God? Is that what you're saying? It, it, oh, let me, let me make sure I understand that. He says, listen, are you saying that I'm the son of God? And then he said, well, let me ask you some questions. And Jesus went on to ask him six questions, right? And that, you know, the, the Ten Commandments has Ten Commandments. The first four deal with honoring God. Say honoring God. The next six deal with honoring men. Say honoring men. So Jesus then listed the six that dealt with men. He said, let me ask you this. Have, you know, have you ever lied, right? Have you ever cheated? Uh, uh, have you ever committed adultery? Have you ever killed? You know the commandments, these things. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not. And the guy said, I've kept those from, my, from the time I was a little boy. But if you go back, this is what the, the guy actually said. He said, teacher... I have kept those from the time that I was a boy. He started the conversation by saying, good teacher. Jesus said, there's only one good, that's God. Are you saying that I'm him? And after he said the six commandments, the guy came back and dropped the good. He dropped the word good. That means that he did not see Jesus as the son of God. If he did, maybe we would have got a different reaction out of this guy. So let me tell you what the guy did. After Jesus asked him, he said, yeah, those six things, I've done that since I was a boy. So then Jesus turned around and said, okay, since you've done those six things since you were a boy, verse 21, Jesus said, the Bible says he looked at him and he loved him and he said, one thing you lack. Wait a minute, Pastor Carlos, there's 10 commandments. Jesus just quizzed him on the first six. Oh, no, on the last six, and he said he got those covered. So there's four that he didn't cover. Jesus turns around and says, you lack one thing. Say one thing. Why not four things? Because those four things are one thing. Jesus said all the law, all the prophets can be wrapped up into this. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, thy soul, thy strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself. It can be summarized in two things, loving God and loving man. You tell me that you love men. Let's see if you love God. Sell everything that you have. Give it unto the poor. Then you will have treasures in heaven, in the kingdom of God. You're going to have treasures in my domain, and I want you to follow me. He says, sell everything that you have. If you do that, give it to the poor. Watch this. You're going to be storing up for yourself treasures in heaven, And 
I'm giving you an invitation to join my team to follow me. The guy, the Bible says, left sad because he had a lot of money. Jesus didn't tell him to leave. He left on his own, and he left sad. Why? The Bible says because he had a lot of money. This is the only person in the Bible that Jesus ever said, follow me to. This is the only person that ever got an invitation to be a disciple that turned Jesus down. And, it, and he turned Jesus down because of money. He turned, and the issue is not, say this, say money makes an excellent servant. But money makes a poor master. Listen, money makes an excellent servant. Money makes a poor master. God doesn't have a problem with you having money. God has a problem with money having you. This guy had money in the spot in his heart where God was supposed to be. And because of that, he walked away sad. He turned Jesus down. Now, Jesus was not saying that, that if you give everything away, you're not going to have anything. How do, where do you get that from? Oh, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading what happened here in Mark chapter 10, and I'll explain it. So he was telling them, sell everything. Listen, you're going to have riches, and also you're going to be able to be on my team. Follow me. So he, he left. The easy-to-read version says, the man was upset with Jesus when he told him to give away his money. He didn't want to do it because he was very rich, so he left very sad, right? He was not willing to let go of what he had. Verse 23, then Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? But the disciples were like, what do you mean? What do you mean? And Jesus said, listen, how hard is it for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of God? So Jesus clarified it. He, this man trusted money more than he trusted God. The money, God doesn't need your money. Let's be clear about something. God does not need your money. God owns everything. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to the Lord. The Bible says, if, if I was hungry, I would not ask you. That's what God, God said. Like, if I need something, I don't need to ask you. I own everything. God doesn't need your money. But what God is looking for is your heart. God is looking for your trust. And let's be honest. If you look at your checking account and you look at what you spend money on, that's where your heart is. Right? Some people spend money on sports because that's what they do. That's where their heart is. Some spe people, sp I don't want to step on no toes. I don't want to get down into the pocketbooks and shoes and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but if you look at what you spend your money on, that's where you are. You spend money on what you love or you spend money on what you like. You spend money on what you're committed to. You're, and he was saying, listen, his heart, he has more trust in the money than he does in God. And so what God wants to see is that there's some giving in that ledger because if in your ledger there's no giving, he has to question your heart. If, if you have a category where you're spending money on everything but God and you don't have God anywhere in your record of giving, God has to question your heart. And so, so it's a matter of trust. Say trust. And so Jesus said in verse 25, you know what? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to make it into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished. And they said, who then can be saved? Verse 27. And Jesus looked at them and said, listen, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Listen, with God, all things are possible. I know that it's not easy to give up money. I know that it's not easy to get uh, uh, where, where you are free to, Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. It's not easy to get to the point where you're willing to give any amount and you're not concerned about any number, that there's no number that's too big. for. Listen, but Jesus said with men, this is impossible, but with God, it's possible. God is able to transform your heart to the point where you want him more than anything else. Lord, all I just, I just want you more than anything else, where you are the number one in my life. You have the first place. With men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. God, say, God, transform my heart. 
God can transform your heart to the point where God can give you money with a mission. God can give you prosperity with a purpose. God can make money part of your ministry. God can, why? But your heart has to be open to it. Your heart has, listen, there are people that serve God in all of these different areas, but they don't serve God in the area of money because, oh, I don't know, the way I was raised, you know what I'm saying? Mm, I don't know. And, you know. I was told, like, you know, I, I will give to all kinds of stuff. I'll show up. I will serve. I'll be here for 12 hours on a Saturday. Saturday if you want me to, but don't ask me to give no money. There's some people that are like that because of whatever experiences they had. And Jesus said, it's hard. I understand with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And with God, God can transform your heart to where you, you become a conduit of kingdom finance. So where God can use you to finance kingdom projects all over the world. What God can use, listen, I, you're, you're thriving in lots of areas of ministry. You, God can transform your heart to where you can thrive in this area as well. Say amen to that. When God dealt with me, listen, my wife grew up with no running water, no electricity. My, grew up, my wife grew up real poor, abject poverty. I grew up on welfare. At least we had welfare. At least we had food stamps. And when God told me that he was going to use money to be part of our ministry and he was going to use us to fund projects all over the world, I didn't know where it was going to come from. But the first step was opening my heart to it. My heart had to be transformed. I just wanted, I just needed to want God and, and, and so that I can be a conduit of kingdom finance. People come to me and say, Brother Pena, can you pray for me? Yeah, or, or people in my family, hey, hey, pray for me. Hey, right now my business is going through a rough time. Okay, you know, la cosa tan mala, things are difficult. Can you pray for my business? Oh, I have no problem. Let's pray for your business. Yeah, I just need my business, man. Si Diosito, if my God would just give me a little blessing, you know what I'm saying? Just give me a little blessing on my business. Okay, cool, let's pray. Oh, before we pray, can I ask you a question? Sure, what's the question? Does any money leave your business and go into the kingdom? Uh, what, what you mean? What you mean? Dude, that's not a difficult question. You know what I'm saying? That's a real simple question. Does any money leave your business going to the kingdom? Uh, 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 well, does any money leave your household going to the kingdom? Uh, uh, so then why would God bless you? I'm asking. Like, I mean, for real. Real talk. So what are you asking for? You're asking for God to bless you so you can get another car? You're asking for God to bless you so you can get another house? Or are you part of God's system? Are you part of the system that is advancing God's kingdom in this world? Are you, part, are you sowing into ministry that are getting people saved? Or are you partnering with somebody that, 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 that we have eternal riches in heaven, that you're seeing people born again, delivered and set free? Are you, are you sowing into the kingdom or you just want more stuff? God doesn't have a problem with you having stuff. God has a problem when stuff is all you want. I remember my, my mom not too long ago walked past my closet. Uh, uh, I'm not even going to talk about my wife's closet. I'm just going to talk about my closet. But anyway, uh, 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 walked past my closet, and she said to me, uh, Lenin, you have a lot of shoes. And I was like, okay. And she said, eso es malo. I said, what? She's like, that, that's bad. I said, what? She said, you have a lot of shoes. I said, yes. She said, that's bad. I said, why is that bad? See, I don't know. I don't know. I just, it's, just, it's just bad. I said, no, 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 no. I, I'm not going to let you off the hook, mommy. Explain to me. Why is that bad? Well, it's just bad. Why? Because in your mind, you've equated poverty to piety. Some way, somehow, the devil has convinced people that being broke is righteous. And there's no righteousness in poverty. And so I was like, no, mommy, if you're saying that it's bad because I have a lot of stuff, are you saying I need to give away? Well, how, do you know anybody that gives more than we give? No. So then what's the problem? I don't care about shoes. I mean, we give away stuff. But if I like shoes, God will say like, hey, it's okay. You can have shoes if that's what you like. God doesn't have a problem with you having stuff. God has a problem with stuff having you. So Peter says in the text, well, Lord, we've given up everything to follow you. And Jesus said, hold on, Peter, let me slow your roll for a minute. If Jesus was from Brooklyn, I, man, I wish there was like a Brooklyn version. You know what I'm saying? There's no, there's no Brooklyn version. So I, I, sometimes I use the RPV, the Rick Pena version, and that's like a Brooklynite version. In the RPV, J Jesus would say, oh, slow your roll, Peter. Slow your roll, Peter. God would never be in debt to you. 
No man that gives up. Read the text. Brother, mother, sister, houses, land, businesses, nothing you give up for me or for the kingdom. He said, you shall receive a hundredfold, a hundred times more. What? Houses, brother, everything reproduces after its kind. Houses, brothers, sisters, mother, land, bit, whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sow, that shall he also reap. You will get a hundredfold now in this world and with that eternal life. So I'm still going to heaven. But God, watch this. God wants me to be saved. I don't have to be miserably saved. I'm going to heaven, but I don't, I, I, it's okay to enjoy the ride. It's okay to be blessed down here. Or you, you're storing up. No, 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 I'm not. I'm storing up treasures in the kingdom, and God richly blessed me. God gives me all things richly to enjoy. It's okay for me to be blessed because we sow. And the more I give, the more God gives to me. Say amen to that. But the text says, watch this. If you sow, whatever you, get, you, whatever you give up, you're going to reap a hundredfold now with persecution. It's in the text. Because once you start sowing, and once you start reaping, and once you start sowing, and once you start reaping, and once your life is changed to the point where, where you're not living the way that you used to be living, and you have an overflow, and you can give, and you love to give, and your heart is in your giving, and the more you give, the more God gives to you, people are going to talk about you. The people closest to you. People will be like, mm, yeah, don't go to that church. All they talk about is money. When we barely ever talk about money. Why? Because it comes with persecution. You know what I've learned? I've learned that people criticize what they do not understand. People will criticize your harvest and they have no idea about your seed. They're criticizing your harvest when they were not around when you were sowing seed when you had no money. When you're sowing seed, like me and my wife, we've been, well, there's four categories of giving that I talk about, tithes, offering, sowing into ministry, giving to the poor. And we, we do all four of those every month, and we have for over 20 years. And every month we do all of this, and we're giving, and we're giving, and we're giving, even when we didn't have anything. We were giving. And so what people don't know is that you can't give like that consistently, intentionally for 10 years, and 20 years, and 25 years, and not be blessed. And people criticize the harvest because they don't know your seed. You got seed in the ground. And then people say, oh, Lord, why don't you do it for me? You did it for him. Why don't you do it for me? Well, fine. It's sowing and reaping. You, you, if you don't like the harvest you're reaping, you got to check the seed that you're sowing. It's time to sow. Like, you got to get on the sowing train if you want to be on the reaping train. You have to sow in order to reap. If you don't sow in this area, I know that you serve in all kind of ministries and you love that. But if this is an area of your life where you haven't been active, it's an area where you need to get active if you want to be able to reap a harvest in this area. Everything belongs to God anyway. As I close, let me tell you this story. I remember as a little kid, I used to get a quarter, 25 cents or 50 cents on Saturday so I could play video games down at the arcade. And I was really good at video games. So I would make that 25 cents or 50 cents last a long time. But I remember there was a Mother's Day coming up. And I was like, man, I want to give my mom a gift because she's such a blessing to me. So every time my mom gave me 25 cents or 50 cents, I saved it. I didn't play video games. I sacrificed. And I kept saving it and saving it. I tried to do other little things for other people to get 25 cents, 50 cents, maybe a dollar. And I saved up all of this money. And it was Mother's Day, and I had $7. And I'm from East New York, Brooklyn, and I grew up on the corner of New Jersey and Sutter. And I walked across the street, Pennsylvania Avenue, Sutter Avenue. There was two pharmacies there. I went to the one on the left, coming from Sutter Avenue. I walk into this little pharmacy, and I look around to find something for my mother. I can remember it like it was today. And there was this little thing where you cut onions. Where you like put an onion in there and you like smash it and you know you chop up the onions or something. And I remember that like when you cut onions, people cry. So I was like, maybe this would be good for my mother. And it was $6.99. $6.99. I 
I had $7. And I walked up to the counter. And I said, hey, I want to buy this. And they said, oh, you don't have enough because you don't have enough for the taxes. And I put my head down. And I said, well, I just want to buy this for my mother for Mother's Day. And the lady was like, oh, okay, don't worry about it. And she gave it to me. And she put it in a brown paper bag. I didn't have no gift wrapping. I didn't have anything. I was a little kid. And I walked back home. And I went to my mother and I said, Mommy, here. Happy Mother's Day. And she looked at me and she looked at that and she said, where'd you get the money for this? I said, I got it from you. When it came time to build the temple, David raised an offering and all the people gave. He said, Lord, we're just giving back to you out of what you've given unto us. Everything belongs to you anyway. It's not about 10%. It's not about tithes. It's not about this. It doesn't, listen, everything belongs to you, God, anyway. And it's a privilege, it's an honor for us to be able to give back to you out of what you've already given to us. This is why our heart is in our giving. Our, our giving is an act of worship. It's not something I've got to do. Giving is something I get to do. It's a privilege. I get to give back to God out of what he's given to me. It's a privilege. I get to bring money to God and say, God, I love you. I thank you. One day I'm going to have more. One day. One day I'm going to have more than this. But this is what I have right now. And I'm going to give it. And I'm going to sow it. And I'm going to give it back to you out of my heart. And my heart is in my giving. And I want you to receive it as an offering, God. And I love you. I know we worship God in so many areas. Let's please not forget to worship God in this area. There's a power in sowing and reaping. But our heart has to be in it. Let's stand all over the room. Real quick, real quick. If I would have pre preached on, on, on healing, I would have called everybody that's sick to come up here. If this message was for you, don't worry about the person to your left or to your right. If this message was for you, this is an area of your life where you need to get better. God is pricking your heart. The Holy Spirit is talking to you. Run up here to the altar. Hurry up. Get up here. I want to pray for y'all real quick before I let you go. Come, come, come. All over the room. Just come quickly. Come quickly. My heart is in my giving. I just want to give. God, I just want to, I want to be in a position to where I can give to you and I will not run out and I will not be in lack and I will always have. The Bible says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you to where you will always have all sufficiency in all things at all times. You'll never run out. You'll be able to always meet the needs of every situation. That's the grace of God. But your heart has to be in it. If that's you all over the room, come up here quickly. I'm about to pray. Those of you that are up here, pray. That's between you and God. Spend a moment talking to God and then I'm going to pray for you.